book of Matthew chapter 12. And there in Matthew chapter 12, we've got like three verses that we're going to read. Matthew chapter 12, if you find it, would you stand with me please in reference to the reading of the scripture. Matthew chapter 12, talk to you about two men of the Bible, one being exceptionally more important than the other. Matthew chapter 12, would you look please at verse 38. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. What a blessing to see you folks here in church tonight. Matthew 12, 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And this is particularly true upon the Jews that they wanted a sign all of the time. 1 Corinthians 1.22 says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But don't you find it to be true even of Gentiles that uh, if we just allow ourselves in our human nature that we want things confirmed just by something we can look at rather than read the Word of God and take God at face value in His Word? But He answered and said unto them, this is reply to their request for a sign, an evil an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I'd like to take that significant verse, verse 40, for our text tonight to talk to you about two men. Verse 40, if you let me, I'll read it one more time, then we'll pray. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the blessings we have enjoyed at your hand in this service tonight. What a joy it is to have a Bible-believing, fundamental, independent Baptist church of blood-bought, born-again people to assemble with in this wicked world in which we, uh, who are out there either in shopping and other activities and employment or whatever, we rub shoulders and elbows with these wicked people on a daily basis. What a good and blessed thing it is to be able to have a local church, to be able to meet with people who are washed in the blood, people who believe you, people who pray, people who want to live right, people who want to glow and shine for the Master. And I pray that you'd bless our time together tonight. And I ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would bless the preaching of the Word of God. May Jesus be magnified. May Christians be blessed and helped. And if there's anyone in our service tonight who is unsaved, I pray that the Spirit of God would deal with them before it's everlastingly too late. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Won't you be seated, please? The Lord did give many signs and wonders. Many signs and wonders. As a matter of fact, sometimes when the people ask to see a sign or a wonder, uh, on the previous pages just prior to reading that, you'll find the Lord having performed some great miraculous sign or wonder. But of all of the signs and wonders that our Savior performed, and we know that when He did it, it was primarily to confirm His Word to unbelieving Jews. For 1 Corinthians 1.22 says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. In John 4, verse 48, Jesus said, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, even as we have similar wording here in verse 39. But Jesus said that there was only one that was going to be given to this adulterous generation. And that sign was the sign of Jonah. And his three days and three nights that he spent in Whale Theological Seminary. And if you wonder why I call it that, I 
I'm saying that many times you can really learn a lesson when God takes you to the woodshed. Amen. And applies the board of correction to you and you get an education from the Lord. And it was, it was Big Fish U, BFU, Big Fish University that he attended for three days and three nights and graduated with a, with a degree of, you might call it, wherever he leads, I'll go. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and as the Lord came to it the second time and said, Son of man, rise up and go to Nineveh. And in the O'Neill Revised Version of the Bible, it says, and Jonah said, you know what, Lord, I've always wanted to go to that place. Yeah. <laughs> I've always wanted to minister there. You see, the Lord had worked him over in, uh, in the woodshed. The title of the message tonight is Jonah and Jesus. Amen. Jonah and Jesus. Now I want you to think with me with what the Bible says there because Jonah was a significant man in a number of ways and especially significant because when they required a sign and asked him for a sign, he says, I'm only going to give you one. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you one. And that sign is one man from the Old Testament. One of the small little books of the Old Testament. Just four chapters back there. And you can read it through in no time at all. And if you're not careful, if your mind wanders, you'll be through the four chapters and not even remember much of what you read. But it's a very significant chapter, very significant book, very significant individual. And I want to point out to you some of the similarities and some of the differences between the two men. God, I hear, wants you to note specifically the similarities. One of the ways that you learn Bible is by comparing Scripture with Scripture. And you notice things that are alike and notice things that are different. When you notice things that are different, that's called rightly dividing the word of truth. That is, you are able to tell the difference. Some of you ought to be able to tell the difference between, like I was reading uh, this week, I was reading about where uh, certain things could be eaten in the Old Testament, certain things could not be eaten. And the difference between that and now is, if you can thank God for it, you can eat it. That's right. Amen. That's what the New Testament says. Yeah. And you need to rightly divide the word of truth. Otherwise, somebody could put that Old Testament passage on you from Leviticus chapter 11, and you would not be able to eat your crawdads and your catfish <laughs> and, uh, and the other things that you might enjoy uh, eating. First of all, point number one. This is going to be an easy message to follow. I want to point to you to Jonah, and I call Jonah, Jonah the sign. Jonah the sign. You see, Jonah was the one sign that the Lord said he was going to give. Look at it, verse 39, if you still have your Bibles open. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet uh, Jonas. Now I'm going to mention some things to you about Jonah that I think you ought to remember. That you ought to compare to the Lord Jesus Christ that you ought to think about with regard to you and your obedience or disobedience to what the Lord commands for you to do, you're not saved by going to Nineveh. You're not saved by obeying God's call uh, to service. But you can benefit from obedience and you can get a beaten from disobedience. Anybody know what the word beaten means? Yeah. It's called correction and chastisement. In South Georgia, we called it a whooping. Yeah. A whooping, W-H-U-P-P-I-N apostrophe. That's the way yeah. it's properly spelled. Jonah the sign. First of all, I want you to think of the man. Jonah was not a myth. He was a man. Amen. Jonah was not a fable. He was a man. Amen. By the way, Adam and Eve were not a fable either. There was, was a man named Adam, a woman uh, named Eve. And when we read about the, the man named Jonah, he was a real man of history. Now, he was a, a son of someone called Amittai. You'll find that in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. But that's not the only scripture. You'll also find Jonah mentioned 
as the son of Amittai in 2 Kings 14, verse 25. I'm not going to take you there for time's sake, get you to find the verse, but I just give you the reference in case you want to jot it down to look up later. We're saying to you that Jonah was a real man when we mentioned Jonah the sign. Jesus never questioned the things of the Old Testament. Amen. When He referred to the Old Testament, He just referred to them as a matter of fact. He said, remember Lot's wife. He said, as it was in the days of Noah. And when He talked about the Old Testament, He never said, now you know that allegory back there? You know that fable back there? You know that story that we told to try to teach you a spiritual truth? No, He just referred to them as truth. And He said that heaven and earth shall pass away, but My word shall not pass away. And He said there's not going to be one jot or tittle of the Old Testament that wouldn't be fulfilled. And so Jonah was a man. He was a child of a Mentai, and he was a called prophet. He was a prophet of God. He's called that in Jonah. He's called that in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 25. The second thing that I want to point out to you from, from the tale of Jonah was that's comparable to why Jesus came into this world is the second thing I'm going to say, the first one is a man. Second thing I want to bring up is what I'm going to call the mess. The mess. And the mess was caused by sin. Uh, not everything that looks like a mess in this world is sinful, but just about all of them are caused by sin. I told somebody the other day that I don't believe that every divorce is sinful in itself, but every divorce is caused by sin. Because God does not want two people that get married to break up. God wants them to be able to uh, stay together. And, uh, and the mess that this world is in today is because of sin. The mess that churches get into today is because of sin. You ever get a bad Baptist business meeting? and you get a mess going on, and the church gets divided, don't you know there's sin in the camp? Yep. It could be in the pulpit, could be in the pew, could be in leadership offices, but there's sin in the camp. In every case, and you get a mess in a country, it's sin that's the cause. You get a mess in a, uh, in a, in a home, sin is the cause. And the mess that uh, was, was uh, brought up in Jonah's day was a sinful people in a place that was a big place. It was a great place. You might think of it as a country, but the Bible calls it a great city. And that city was Nineveh. But that wasn't all the problem. In addition to a great city that was wicked, that was exceedingly wicked. He said, the Lord said, their wickedness is come up before me. It had raised up like a stink into heaven, into the nostrils of God. And God said, I need a man to go there and represent me and tell them to get right. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I do not believe that the, that the gospel of the grace of God today is to try to reform everybody in the world. But it is true that God's people through the years have even rebuked uh, political leaders. As a matter of fact, uh, the only Baptist in the Bible was named John. And John got executed because of personally pointing out the sins of a political leader. Mm -hmm. His wife didn't like it, and uh, she, had Jonah, uh, she had John the Baptist uh, beheaded. But there was a sinful people in the city of Nineveh, and there was a self-righteous I believe he was prejudiced. There was a self-righteous, a slothful, stubborn prophet named Jonah. Jonah said, I'm not going. Now we don't find Jonah doing like Jeremiah did, saying, I'm not preaching anymore in his name. Jonah just says, I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm not going. Lord has a way of changing your mind, though, doesn't He? Mm -hmm. A self-righteous, stubborn, slothful prophet was part of the mess. And then there was a sure punishment, both for those wicked people in Nineveh 
and for this wicked prophet who would not obey God and go to where uh, God wanted him to go. A third M I'll give you, if you're all following. The first was the man, Jonah. The second was the mess, which Jonah was part of. The third thing I want to point out to you about Jonah, uh, the sign, is the must. The must. M-U-S-T. There was a, a, an absolute necessity that was evidenced when, Noah got on, when Jonah got on that boat. Do you all remember that there was a great big storm and they were praying they were trying to figure out how can we survive this storm. They, they found one guy who wasn't praying. He was asleep. That's that preacher. And they went down and they said, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise and call upon thy God. We need to have a prayer meeting. And so uh, Jonah met with him and talked with him and he said, It's my fault. And then he said, What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to to cast me overboard. You have to cast me into the water. They rebelled against that. They tried to uh, lighten up the ship by throwing things overboard. They went back to rowing, rowing as hard as they could, and, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And then they realized that Jonah's death was a must. Mm -hmm. Now here's the picture, folks. Jonah was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this was all done on purpose. This was recorded on purpose. And so Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly for a sign. So he had to die. He had to go into this watery grave. And they were not going to get any peace without the death of Jonah. And I want you to know, even in your own heart and life, I realize Jesus Christ died. I know that it's happened. But you will never get peace of mind. You'll never get peace with God until your peace comes from the one who died. Amen. I'll give you two illustrations of what, what will not work. One is they tried to throw things overboard so that they could make the journey successfully in the storm. You know what a lot of people do? Rather than put their faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us, they want to quit smoking. They want to quit drinking. They want to quit gambling. They want to quit their filthy talking. And they figure, if I can just quit doing enough things, then I'll be able to make it okay. That's pictured by those people throwing things overboard. Nobody will get saved by quitting a lot of stuff. It'd be great for you personally if you did quit a lot of those things. You'd probably do better. You know unsaved people would, would do better if they quit their gambling? Unsaved people would do better if they quit their fornicating. It'd preserve a lot of peace and happiness in their home if they quit doing some of this stuff. Give up your liquor, quit it. But that won't get you to heaven. Amen. Another thing that they tried to do, besides quitting stuff that you can really get a lesson from, I'm saying the must is Jonah had to die. Amen. No. And the must is Jesus had to die. Amen. You cannot throw everything overboard and make it there successfully. You won't do it. The other thing they did is they tried to row hard for land. They said, we dumped all this stuff up. Let's go. Come on. Put your arms into it, guys. Put your backs into it. Let's go. We can make it. The harder they rowed, the more helpless that it looked. They realized they were not going to make it. Same thing can happen to anybody. You can quit doing bad stuff and you can join the church. You can quit doing some bad stuff and you can get baptized. You can quit doing some bad things. You can surrender to the ministry. You can quit some bad things. You can take a Sunday school class or you can start singing in the choir. You can start giving a great big amount of your money to the church if you want to and you won't find peace with God. Yeah. And you will not know for sure you're going to heaven because you're not going to heaven without the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's a little lesson that you could, that's a little lesson that you could get from that is the must was Jonah had to. He said... Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. In Jonah 1.12, he said, so, so shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this tempest is upon you. Dropping weights didn't work. Dedicated effort at rowing didn't work. The drowning of Jonah worked. Putting him down in that, in that ocean. The next M that I want to give you from Jonah, the sign, is the miracle. The miracle. Well, 
part of the miracle was is that the uh, that the bad storm stopped and they were grateful for that that was a miracle another miracle that happened with Jonah in the book of Jonah was a buried man was raised up I personally think that it's very likely that Jonah actually died in the fish's stomach. I just give that to you. I'm not saying it dogmatically. I'm just saying I personally think it's very likely that Jonah actually died. I got some reasons for that, and I'll show you that from Jonah chapter 1 and Jonah chapter 2. But whether or not that he literally died, and I believe that he did, he was raised up from that burial under the sea. He was raised up. What's that a picture of? That's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph or his folk. It was a miracle, folks. So much of a miracle that unsaved people today uh, fight us and hate us uh, because that they know that this miracle is recorded in the Bible. Yeah. And they want to say that, that that could not happen. It could not happen. It's kind of like their objections to uh, Noah. Uh, and the survival on the ark. There's no way all the animals could get in the ark, they tell you. And I, I would suggest this to you, and I'm not saying that you've got to come up with statistics. You can if you want to. But next time somebody says that, say, oh, really? They couldn't get on, on the ark? How many went? How many animals went on the ark? You know, ask that to the person who says that there's no way that all those animals could have got on the ark. <laughs> next thing you want to ask him is, how big was that ark, by the way? <laughs> and you know what? They will dogmatically tell you, oh, you foolish Christian. You actually believe. There's no way that all the animals could get in the ark. And then at the same time, they have no idea how many made the trip. And they don't know how big the ark was. That'd be like some of y'all saying, sounds like y'all had a big crew that went south yesterday. How in the world did all of you get in that vehicle? <laughs> and I were to say, you know, I don't think I told you what vehicle we went in. <laughs> and I don't think I told you exactly how many of us went. <clears throat> Why would you doubt that we could get on the, in the vehicle when you don't know how many of us went? There might have only been two of us go. <laughs> we might have went in a limousine or a train. You don't even know. And that's about how foolish it is for these people who are going to doubt the miracle of uh, Jonah being in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. I want you to know, the Bible says that God prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Matthew 12, 40 defines that fish as a whale. I believe it. But God prepared that fish for that particular cause. And I'm telling you that whatever God had to do, if He wanted to keep him in there, and like I say, I think there's a good there's a good possibility that he died in that fish. But if He wanted to keep Jonah alive in that fish for 30 days, God can do it. God can do it. Some people have told me that they, from our church, that have gone up to see the replica that's been built of Noah's Ark. And if you ever go see something like that, you realize it's pretty big. Yeah. You realize there's a lot of room in there. And it may give you just a little bit different idea about what it was like for those things to, to get on there. I mean, there's nothing that says that every elephant had to be a full-grown mammoth elephant, too. Or every giraffe, you know, was a full-grown uh, giraffe. But the miracle was performed. The next thing I want to point out to you before I talk to you about the second man is the message. And the message is found in Jonah chapter 3, <coughs> verse 4. And there was a is a is a different message than that which met the, which Jesus preached because his message was just one of divine retribution. It was a totally negative message as far as what the Bible tells us that Jonah preached. The Bible doesn't tell us much about what he preached. If he preached a lot more than what's recorded here, we do not know. But what God chose to record in the book of Jonah was this. This is what Jonah preached. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It's 
man marched into Nineveh. I don't know if he still smelled like the inside of a whale or not. But he went into the heart of Nineveh, <coughs> crying out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the Holy Spirit of God blessed his preaching. And these people who knew that they were doing that which is against nature, they knew that they were doing that which is against God. They knew that they were doing that which was against the good of others. Got smitten. And they got smitten so much by the Holy Ghost that even the animals were aware of the emotional upheaval. Do any of you have animals who can tell what it's like when you're really grieving? When you're really upset? These animals, the livestock, they knew that there was something going on. So that even the animals were going around like this. <laughs> Come on, some of you, you, has anybody got a dachshund? Yeah. Anybody have a dog that's been chewed out? They'll do like that. If they, if they know that they're in trouble, or they know there's something bad going on. <laughs> Come on, anybody have a dog like that? Uh, that, that, uh, that got in trouble. Well, that's the message. It was negative, but praise God, that message had delightful results. As the people turned around, got right with God, of course, there was one person that wasn't delighted. I think if God was delighted, the people got right with God, and He spared the city. That old preacher named Jonah, he was wanting, for a, he was wanting to wipe out. He was wanting all of them to die and perish. And his, proof, his preaching proved true. But the second person that I want to talk to you about, that's Jonah, the sign. You see how that Jonah is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in that he went to that watery grave and he died uh, for the salvation of those people that were trying to make their journey and couldn't make it as long as he was on board. Once he died, they were able to make it. It's all a picture of the deliverance that Jesus was going to bring. That is Jonah the sign. Secondly, point number two, Jesus the Savior. Jesus the Savior. Jonah the sign of Jesus the Savior. The Bible says, And on this man's seed hath God, according to His promise, raised unto Israel a Savior. Jesus. That's Acts chapter 13, verse 23. At Christmas time, we read from Luke 2, 11, that unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Let me give you the same things uh, real quickly about Jesus. First of all, the man. I want you to know, my friend, that Jesus was a man. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repeated, repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Amen. Jesus was a man, but he was a greater man than Jonah. Amen. The things that we said bad about Jonah could not be said about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He was not disobedient. He was not selfish. He was not proud. He was not prejudiced. He was not stubborn. He was not slothful. He was a greater man. He was a good man. He was the only good man that's ever lived. Amen. Romans 3.12 says, For there is none that doeth good, no, not one. He said to one man, he said, Why callest thou me good? He says, There is none good but one. That is God. Right. And that's not saying that Jesus wasn't good. What he was saying was, is he wasn't good unless he was the God-man. Right. Amen. Amen. He was the God-man. He was a man. He was a greater man than Jonah. He was a good man. That's because he was the God-man. Isaiah 9, 6 calls him the everlasting Father. calls him the mighty God. He's the express image of God's person in Hebrews 1, 3. In Hebrews 1, 8, the Father said, Thy throne, O God, talking to Jesus, is forever and ever. Then with Jesus, I want to not only mention the man, but the mess. Does everybody know what the mess is? The mess is you. Not Nineveh. Jacksonville. <laughs> the mess is you. The mess is me. The mess is this world. For all 
have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there was, like with Nineveh, a sinful people, but there's a sure punishment. And this punishment is not the destruction of the city. This punishment is eternal torment. Everlasting torment. And what is the must? The must is once again Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. I'm saying there's the must of a supernatural birth. You must be born again. John 3, 5 to 7. There, uh, there's a, the must of a sinless life and Jesus led it. There's the must of a super, of a substitutionary death and Jesus laid down His life for our sins. All of our iniquities were laid upon Him. There's the must of Jesus and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that Jonah pointed to. What's the miracle that we find of Jesus Christ? Well, uh, that was a miracle for Jonah to come up from the dead. But what about Jesus? I mean, you think about the barriers that were removed when Jesus rose from the dead. There was the barrier of a slain man. Jesus was not swooning. He died. He was slain. There was the barrier of, his, of the sepulcher. There was the barrier of the seal around the stone. There was the, the barrier of the soldiers. There was the barrier of the scoffers. There was the barrier of Satan. And all of it going against Jesus. And still, up from the grave, He arose. They buried Him, but He got up from the dead. You can't keep a good man down. There is none but one that's good, and that is God. And He got up. The last thing I'd like to mention to you about the Savior, Jesus the Savior, is His message. The message of Jonah was a message of divine retribution. But it did bring forth delightful results. And the nation, uh, the city, which was like a nation, was saved. It was a great city. The Lord's message that is preached today after Him dying, being buried and rising again, dying for our sins, is a message not of retribution, hallelujah, a message of redemption. Redeemed. I love to proclaim it. It's a message that also has delightful results. It's a message with dedicated representatives, and that's you. You're the Jonas of today. That God wants to carry that good news. The gospel is good news. Amen. We tell people the good news that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world, condemned the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. What a blessing to have a part in bearing the good news. May the Lord help you and me. May the Lord help this church to do it this coming week. May we even see people walking this aisle on Sunday confessing Christ as Savior. Won't you bow your heads with me? Let's stand together and bow. Stand together with me. Heads bowed, eyes closed. We're going to have an invitation. Would you like